Okay, good evening, everyone. It is 530. I'm going to call the meeting to order. If you all rise and join me at the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, first on our agenda this evening is special recognition. Uh, Education Support Professionals Week. Dr. Pierce will be presenting. have special recognition tonight because it is education support professionals week and it's exciting because we have some education support professionals here to actually be recognized uh, during recognition so we appreciate you all being here and um, just to share some information with the board uh, when it comes to our staff in Kennewick School District we have 545 paraeducators 140 transportation staff, 105 nutrition services staff members, 144 secretaries, and 151 maintenance and operations staff who are uh, educational support professionals who work uh, with our schools and our students uh, to help provide the great education that we do here in KSD. We've got uh, PSE, uh, Public School Employees uh, Leadership here. Um, some people here, but I wanted to recognize all of the leadership for paraeducators. It's Brandy Strait and Melanie Stong. And Brandy is here. And do you, well, you can at least wave Brandy and be recognized, okay? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Transportation, Peggy Morgan. Peggy's here. Yay, Peggy. <laughs> And I want to make sure I, I knew for sure that Brandy and Peggy were going to be here tonight. So I want to make sure I didn't leave any of the leadership off, but I want to recognize everybody. Um, Stephanie Wright from Nutrition Services. I just want to make sure nobody snuck in on me here. Um, Melanie Tackett for Secretaries. And uh, Jeff Richmond for Maintenance and Operations. Okay. All right. So that's our PSE leadership um, who we collaborate with and, and work together with. Uh, to um, help support uh, employees and we've got um, a number of employees here and so if you're here to be recognized could you just raise your hand so we know who you are and we're going to give you a big round of applause. Um, we have some traditions here in KSD. Uh, we uh, do some special deliveries out to the buildings that will happen next week um, in honor of Education Support Professionals Week. Um, it fell kind of between board meetings, so we wanted to do it tonight uh, because if we waited till the next board meeting, it would be late. Um, so we're doing it a little bit early, um, but we'll do some special things next week as well. But tonight I want to read the governor's proclamation and uh, it states, Whereas education support professionals are involved in nearly every aspect of education, maintaining buildings and grounds, preparing and serving meals, keeping school facilities clean and orderly, assisting in the classroom, providing over 60% of all instructional hours to special education, English language learners and opportunity gap students, performing and conducting research activities, providing information technology and media services, administrative support functions, and safe transportation, creating a secure and healthy environment and many other specialized services. And whereas more than 62,000 education support professionals work with and help students in Washington's universities, colleges, and public schools are the backbone of our public education system and deserve recognition and thanks for their outstanding work that they do for this state and their communities. And whereas education support professionals are instrumental in fulfilling the state's responsibility to educate all students and by supporting the learning environment, they serve as critical partners with teachers, parents, administrators, and school boards. Now, therefore, I, Jay Inslee, governor of the state of Washington, do hereby proclaim March 5th through the 11th, 2023 as educational support 
or excuse me, Education Support Professionals Week in Washington, and I encourage all people in our state to join me in this special observance. So again, uh, you could join me in giving a round of applause to our Education Support Professionals. Uh, we really appreciate all the work they do. And it's great that you uh, were here tonight to actually uh, <laughs> participate in the recognition, so thank you. Thank you, you guys. We, you know, we obviously can't do anything without you. So thank you very much for everyone's service. It is really appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, OK, next on our agenda is communications from parents, staff and district residents. Read my. Guidelines here. The board appreciates hearing from parents, staff and district residents at our regular board meetings. The board of directors provides an opportunity for communications with parents, staff and district residents. This time is reserved for our, during our working meeting for the board to listen to comments, input, and information. The board does not respond to comments provided as our goal is to listen and to learn as appropriate. The board will ask the superintendent and her staff to look into any issues raised. Please note, it is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting. During the public comment period, please refrain from any positive or negative expressions such as clapping or booing in response to a person who is providing public comment. If any audience member has any concerns about how they're being treated by another attendee, please contact a cabinet member to report the issue. The board does not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff members at board meetings. However, you can email the board with any such comments. OK, uh, first speaker this evening is Joan Hugh. Did I say that correctly? It's actually pronounced Hugh. Hugh. OK, well, Hugh, I apologize. Good evening. Uh, I just want to make a, uh, an observation. I've lived over 50 years in Kennewick. My children went to Kennewick schools. We're big supporters of the levy. and so glad that the levy passed. I, you would have gone through a nightmare trying to cut things, I can guarantee you. <clears throat> but two, two items in the Tri-City Herald uh, raised my concern. Um, at one point, Mr. Valentine, you said, when discussing the levy, we need to appeal to conservative voters. And then later on, uh, Mr. Valentine said again, we need to let conservatives know we are listening to them. And all I want to point out tonight is that I and my husband are independent voters. And we also have many friends and live in Kennewick who are Democrats. And those people also love their kids, love the schools, support the schools. So I would recommend to all board members and to Mr. Valentine to enlarge your vision and your concerns to include and embrace all the voting people in Kennewick and all the citizens in Kennewick. We are a diverse group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Tina Gregory. Tina Gregory. I'm very concerned that three of you can't stand up for our children. I still believe the only flags in the classroom should be the American school mascots and curriculum. Since we are allowing religion back into the schools, here are flags for any teacher that wants them free of charge. Please don't discriminate against them. I would also like to start prayer in the classroom and a prayer month. We have a gay pride month. I'm asking that we ban all pornography books that are in our schools. We have books that show adults and children having oral sex and detailed positions. They need to be banned immediately. Taxpayers don't want to pay for these things. I know children are confused and seek sexual things. It's not the responsibility of the school to teach them. The great push for the trans pills and mutilation are not acceptable. These are life changes. Minors should be, shouldn't be coached to do these things. They can't buy alcohol, cigarettes, or vote. The school's job is to teach basic academics. In all the sex ed push, let's teach, ab let's teach abstinence. God has a plan for every person, life. Satan has a plan also, death. Life and death are fiercely competed for our devotion. The subtle ways the enemy achieves his agenda in our lives, he deceives, lies, corrupts, brings shame, 
And then he dangles temptation to us to do things that will kill relationships and destroy families. God has given us everything we need to overcome the enemy's schemes and become conquerors. Our Lord always makes a way for us. The flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So many children are suicidal. This breaks my heart. They are beautifully and wonderfully made. If they open their hearts to our Lord, he can give them peace and understanding. I will continue to pray for our children. They need to know they are loved. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of the wickedness, wickedness in heavenly places. And I'm glad the levy passed also. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Nicole Carber. Sorry, Carby, I apologize. That's all right. Adding, adding letters to your last name. You I weren't apologize. here the last time, so this is all good. So <laughs> I'm going to actually speak to the board as well as the Microsoft teams I have behind me. I want to make it clear as you laid out the rules that I can't acknowledge each of you individually, but I'm going to because there are legal matters at hand. Um, you're going to be receiving an email from me based within the 10 day criteria that's required for the discrimination piece with the Kennewick School District. I want to ask if you were aware that the children who attend school within the Kennewick School District were required to pray to the Hindu gods based off the current curriculum in ancient history without parents knowledge or consent. Yes or no. Michael Connors, yes or no? Ron Maber, yes or no? Diane Sundvik, yes or no? Mike Valentine, yes or no? Gabe Galbraith, yes or no? Patty Lord, yes or no? Well, you're about to find out. For those listening and after getting those responses on record, I would like it noted that the KSD attorneys, Brown and Rio, are members of the LDS Church and were involved in the 2011 situation, as were you with my daughter. That speaks to the premeditative component regarding intent. They are also the city prosecutors for the city of Richland, and I'm sure we're all aware of the resist the recall vote. My name is Nicole Carby. I own a consulting business here in the city of Kennewick, and I, for one, want to thank you for unmasking our children and also not requiring forced immunizations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, that is all we have for in-person speakers. Do we have anyone online that's wishing to speak this evening? Nope. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda is the consent items. It's all good. <laughs> Yeah, ready to go. Okay. Move to approve the consent item as written. Second. There's a second. Any questions or comments? If not, I will call up the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Abstain. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Okay, next up is superintendent and board member reports. Dr. Pierce, would you like to lead us off? Thank you. I just have a couple items. Uh, first, I wanted to just update uh, the board on where we are with the uh, safety officers and the SROs that we're now able to hire because the levy passed. So we're working to finalize the job descriptions and we're working with KPD on the requirements for the limited commission because the candidates will get their limited commission through AP through KPD. Our goal is to post the positions within the next week or two. So we're just we've been working on having everything teed up and and ready to go um, and begin the hiring processes this spring with our goal to hopefully have the people hired by mid May so they can then uh, go through the required requirements, screening and background and training that they need to do with KPD to receive the limited commission so they can begin at the start of the school year in August. So we have some training plans and so forth. So all that's ramping up to really um, start to happen uh, this spring. And on the um, SRO side of things with adding the additional three SROs, uh, we've been working with uh, the city and KPD on their timeline for that. And um, the goal is to have one of the SROs placed by the beginning of the school year and then based on their staffing and training timeline um, to have the other two placed by January. 
so things are coming together uh, quickly, and so we're really excited about that. I just wanted to give an update to the board. And How do people sure apply for that? How do people apply for that? Is that open yet or no? So um, on the on the school resource officer side, that's all through um, KPD. Okay. For the safety officer side, those will be KSD employees that receive their limited commission from KPD. So we'll be posting the elementary safety officer positions uh, here in the next week or two. OK, I know somebody wants to apply. That's why great. That's awesome. OK, the thing I just wanted to briefly share. I know some of you were at some of these same events, so I had the pleasure and privilege of reading at Sunset View Elementary and Canyon View Elementary for their Read Across America events. Also attended the D.A.R.E. graduation over at uh, Ridgeview Elementary, um, which was great fun. It's just great things are happening in our schools. And um, we also held a classified job fair last night. So HR coordinates the job fair. We had leaders from nutrition services, transportation, special education and maintenance and operations there. Um, I should have mentioned this while we had our classified <laughs> uh, education support professionals here, but so we um, it was just a, a well um, coordinated event thanks to Tony and Doug and um, got some great applicants for our um, classified employees. So that was great. And then um, I'm done with my report and I told London I would give her report for her because <laughs> um, she's not feeling the best tonight. Um, <laughs> you're all good. We did have the Superintendent Student Advisory Council uh, meeting today and uh, what we spent some time doing today is looking at our three student focused goals. All students safe, known and valued. All students are engaged learners. All students are ready for their future and we divided up into teams and all of the um, school teams, we, we just counted off by force, they were mixed school teams. They spent some time really um, providing feedback to us about what is going well when it comes to the goals and, and what we're doing in our schools to help meet those goals and what some of the challenges are and what are some things that we could do better. So uh, once each of the groups um, came up with their big lists. We shared out and kind of identified some priority items for us to continue to talk about next meeting, sort of like we did with the, the bathrooms where um, not only did we have the students help identify what some of the issues are, but help brainstorm some solutions or some ways that they think we could make improvements. So that's what we did today, London, and um, it was a great meeting and we missed you. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Gabe? Yeah, so so I had to write some of these down. Um, so I also got to go um, and read to some kids at um, Sunset View, uh, second grade group, which was fantastic. I attended Westgate STEM night. Um, they had a great turnout, lots of um, really cool tables and the kids were excited and really engaging with the table. So that was fun. Uh, I also went to uh, Canyon View Cascade and Sagecrest. They had uh, kind of their read across America nights or, or that week. And so I was able to get to those three schools and uh, <clears throat> see some of the kids there, talk to some of the teachers and, and some of the cool activities they were doing. I went to Fuerza's Kids Day in Engineering uh, this last Saturday. So it was pretty similar to Westgate's, uh, a lot of the same um, work groups and stuff, but it was really, again, it was a great experience to see the kids engaging with the the, the tables and all like the cranes and stuff like that. So it was really fun. And then um, I swung by last night at the, the job fair, um, talked to a handful of different um, folks who were hiring and just kind of checked that out. And um, kudos to HR as well and those who put that together because it was it was pretty good. So that's it. Thank you. Michael. Yeah, um, <clears throat> OK, I, I kind of had a busy couple uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I met with s two different teachers about issues and things, questions they had, and uh, they, they requested to meet, so I did, and it was uh, very, um, I just listened mostly and to uh, some things. So was, that took some time. Um, I had a great meeting here with, with some of the staff um, about uh, identifying challenges with, with um, kids who are having trouble reading the dyslexia, all that kind of stuff. And we really dove into that. That was a follow up from the from the last meeting that the that, that Tracy scheduled. So I appreciate that. That was good. Um, it really helped me understand 
kind of our process and how we go through. So I, I think that's the very first thing that you, you need is you have to understand before you can start um, turning it over in your brain and trying to think of ideas and solutions. But um, it's certainly an issue um, that we need to that we're working through. Um, I know that I know everybody's aware of it and you know, everybody's aware of that situation. So identifying kids that are struggling, that's important. Um, I met with, I uh, had a couple a couple things went on social media and so I, I had a lot of people reach out to me this week. So I actually went to two different homes and met with groups of people about it. Um, and that was a couple hours each. So that was interesting then. But the highlight was probably, which I saved for last, was I went to Sunset View, uh, read with uh, some fourth graders for for an hour or so. It was really fun. Um, just uh, such smart kids. They even taught me a couple a couple things. I actually didn't. I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I didn't know why I sh why there was 13 stripes on the American flag. I actually didn't know that. But um, but a fourth grader taught me why why that's the case. And um, so anyway, I just had that was that was really the highlight is speaking with the with the fourth graders reading to them. So. Thank you. Diane? So I'll start also with the Sunset View reading. And oops, sorry. so I had a group of kindergartner and second graders combined, but I have to, and Sandra Lee is the librarian there. And so I have to um, give a shout out to Sandra. Um, so there's this word onomatopoeia, which is when the word makes the sound that the sound would make. So like splash or whoosh. And so I'm reading and it says splash and this kindergartner says oh, that's onomatopoeia. And I thought, well, I'm like really impressed. <laughs> and then at the end of the story, uh, it it's the little boy is going to go back and do something again. And a second grader goes, oh, that's a circular story. And I was so impressed that not that kids know that because kids can learn those things, but that that is obviously great librarians do great things and that our kids are learning those kinds of things. And so that was, it was great to, to read, but it was great to see their learning too. Um, so I've done two of the WASDA networking hours, um, the legislative rep networking hours. And um, I did write to Patty a little more about what we've been talking about. And then I attended, um, and Mike and Ron were also there with the WASA, WASDA and WASBO legislative conference and day on the hill. And we got to meet with, um, our representatives, uh, Connors and Barnard, for a short period of time before they rushed off, and I appreciated them giving us time, even in their packed uh, time, to um, tell them, you know, what we need and what our students need, and that was important. Um, key connections, uh, always uh, our monthly meeting where we're talking about keeping kids from uh, partaking in drugs and alcohol and what we can do if they are. Um, trying to think um, a TriTech the future chefs competition. It was the second year I did it and um, this year was different and it, there were three fruit salads that all came in for a second and third and it was great because it was supposed to be healthy fruit foods that kids would like and I thought great. So that was very exciting. And then that evening um, I went over afterwards to um, Carmichael to the math is cool fifth grade uh, championship um, and I have to give a shout out. So Vista came in Lynn if I'm wrong straighten me out on this. So Vista came in second place in the um, top category. Cottonwood was first place in the mid category and the Lincoln students, uh, it was their first time in competition. And so that was very exciting. And our um, Kamaiakin students were the um, mentors for them. And so I appreciate them um, doing that. And it was, uh, it, gosh, it was so exciting. It was filled with parents and people were, I mean, it was like, it was, I don't know, it was like going to a huge sports venue. It was so exciting and everybody was very excited. So that was, I loved going to that. That was fun. So it, I think that everything I did, except for maybe having to stay in the hotel that I stayed in, that was icky um, when I went to Olympia. Um, everything else I did was great, but that hotel was bizarre. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to add Representative Blinky. Uh, to the list of people that was very receptive in Olympia. And I also want to say, make sure you write those books that you read with the kids in your blog. Get credit, get credit for it. Good point. All right. That's all I have. Mike, I say one thing. I, yes. I would just feel bad if I forgot the TriTech kids. I, I also went to that 
that thing with Diane. And those kids were awesome. Like they made some really, really cool desserts and they did fantastic. I think your daughter was there and she it was she was she was great. She was she was like really funny and kind of a ham and it was it was really a good time. Yeah, they stopped inviting me. They invited me the first year and I was, I was a horrible, horrible judge that I got I'm out. Oh no. They kicked you out. I took too long. <laughs> It's hard. It's really, really hard. It was, it was, and I, you know, so, but I learned my lesson, and I don't get to come back. And then you didn't get the swag bag. Though, I did. I did. I got nothing. Cool. I was I told you to have a nice evening. <laughs> um. Anyway, so uh, I also went to Olympia to go lobby, which was interesting. It's always fun to go hang out with those guys and listen to what they have to say. Um. Uh, I also went to Sunset View, which was really fun, and it was interesting talking to the principal. She was really, really nice lady. And she's like, God, I can't believe you all came. I'm like, all you have to do is ask. I said, if you ask us, we're all probably going to come. I said, you know, for me, I've got a business I'm running, got things to do. I said, if I don't have an appointment, I'm probably not going to go. But if you tell me to come up, we'll always come. So if you guys want us to show up, just say. Um, so anyway, it was great. I read the kindergartners. So they were right, right up my alley. <laughs> um, the other thing, I also stopped in at the uh, engineering day where I didn't even know what was going on. I just went by to check it out, and it was fascinating. They had over 350 kids go through on Saturday, which I thought was fantastic. I went in at you know 2:30 and it was just it was still packed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was a really really well run deal and Energy Northwest put that on and it was a really really neat program. So uh, glad I ran across it. Anyway, that's all we got. Um, next on our agenda is reports and discussions. Uh, first up is Tribal Collaboration Update. Dr. Pierce will present. take this opportunity to provide an update on our tribal collaboration, uh, primarily with the with the Yakima uh, tribe. And um, I've been keeping the board updated over the past couple of years as things have progressed, but we haven't had the opportunity to do uh, a public presentation. And so we wanted to do that tonight. And I do want to say that um, originally uh, Mr. Arlen was Sheens from the Yakima tribe was going to be here tonight as well. Unfortunately, he had a last minute um, situation that's preventing him from being here. We're gonna schedule him to come um, to a future meeting in the spring, but I still wanted to go ahead and, and give the update because we have some com committee work coming up. And um, so I wanted to make sure that the board is aware and the community is aware of, of what we are doing. And then we look forward to welcoming Mr. Washins to a future meeting. So as, as you know, over the past two years, we have really worked as a school district to strengthen our relationship with the Yakima tribe through the consultation process associated both with the continued use of the Kamaikan Braves mascot and associated with curriculum related efforts um, and just relationship building and strengthening of understanding um, within our school district. Through that consultation process, the Yakima Tribal Council uh, did approve the ongoing use of the Braves mascot and, and we were able to share that. Um, that happened in December of uh, 2022. Um, and they approved a land acknowledgement, a district land acknowledgement, which highlights the district's respect for the Yakima Nation and the ongoing commitment to continuing to build the relationship with the tribe. So I'd like to share the land acknowledgement which states Kennewick School District rests on the ancestral lands of the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation and recognizes and honors the people of the Yakima Nation. We honor the native peoples who are tied to the land through history, legends, and culture. We acknowledge their descendants who live here and continue as protectors of the land, rivers, lakes, and inhabitants of the surrounding area. This acknowledgement is a sincere commitment to show respect, continue to build relationships, and ensure our students learn tribal history and sovereign sovereignty curriculum in our schools. So this land acknowledgement is one that can be uh, read and will be read b uh, before like big district events and um, so forth to uh, acknowledge our commitment and relationship uh, with the Yakima Nation. So I wanna give a little 
update on um, what that collaboration is looking like, not only what it's looked like, but what the plan is moving forward and kind of our progress to date. So uh, this was uh, our team, um, and so you'll see I'm in that picture along with uh, Mr. Matt Scott. Uh, Robin Chastain was there. I think she was taking the picture. Um, and Mr. Chris Chellen, who's with us tonight, of course, uh, Kamiakin principal. And this was um, our, uh, I think it was our third uh, consultation meeting with the Yakima Tribal Council, uh, mainly associated with the ongoing use of the Braves mascot. But this was the meeting where they approved our district land acknowledgement and approved the continued use of the um, of the Braves mascot. Uh, Mr. Washins um, is in the picture right here. And um, you might remember some of you, Elise Washins who also we worked with and she attended a board meeting, gosh, a couple of years ago when, when we were meeting on Zoom um, and really as we were starting with the, with the consultation process with the Yakima. We have um, also now on our district website, I just want to pop out to that really quick and show you. Um, we've got under our um, community tab, uh, information about tribal collaboration, uh, the committees, and I'll speak to those in just a minute, that we're forming, the work that we're doing, um, the process around the Braves mascot and the history there, that'll take you over to the Kamaikan uh, website, and you'll see that same picture there. So uh, this is not new information for the board or the community. We, um, through that process, did update the Braves mascot and logo and the imagery. Um, it's nice that uh, our student board rep is a Kamaikan student because we can see <laughs> her wearing some of the new um, logo and imagery and, and Mr. Chellen's got it on as well. Um, but here's just some pictures from the school that show, you know, what that looks like and the work that we've done um, there to update the imagery. A couple of projects that are still um, underway and to be completed are the gym floor projects. This is a drawing that of what it'll look like and this is still scheduled to be completed uh, during spring break. Getting nodding affirmation from my friends over there and um, the football field project. So this one, um, when I last talked to Eric, they were just waiting for uh, some good weather days to get the, um, the image replaced in the middle of the field. And I'm so is that that one still almost completed? TBD, OK, OK. So um, there's just a couple big outstanding projects that um, we're we're uh, waiting for. And I just want to mention here, one of our plans is, uh, what, especially once the football field is done, to have some kind of um, celebration ceremony to sort of dedicate the new mascot and renew relationship um, with the tribe. You know, when when Kamaya can, and this is where Mr. Chell and I might have you um, move this way a little bit in case I need to ask you a question or have you uh, add some information. But this was even before uh, Mr. Challen's time at Kamaikin that when the Braves mascot first got, um, you know, in use, there was some uh, work with uh, tribal uh, members and some kind of celebration and dedication. And we want to redo that um, with the new mascot and um, also have that opportunity to get the, um, the flag, um, accept the flag from the Yakima Nation to fly um, on the field along with the Washington flag and the United States flag. And so um, one of the things I've shared with the board is they made the offer to um, provide that flag to us. Right now we don't have a, 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 a flagpole, but uh, Mr. Challenge wanted one for quite some time. So when we do the Star Spangled Banner and that kind of thing before um, before games and events, that there's a flag there on the field. So we'd have the American flag, of course, and that flies at the highest level. And then the state flag flies um, at a lower level. And because of the status of the Yakima tribe, they fly at the same level as the state flag. So we'd have both flags there as well. So we, we're, we're looking forward to being able to, to do that. So that's just kind of where we are on the, on the mascot and field sign kind of thing. On the curriculum side, um, we're working to ensure that we're meeting all of the requirements under the law for tribal history and curriculum in our social studies curriculum. So um, 
there were some requirements passed by the legislature back in 2015, so these aren't new things, but um, we are uh, required to in integrate since time immemorial. In fact, Elise Washins is one of the um, co-authors uh, helped to author that curriculum, um, the tribal sovereignty in Washington State um, to be to be integrated into our social studies curricula and um, and we're required to collaborate with our um, nearest federally recognized um, tribe. So uh, we want to make sure that not only we're you know meeting the um, legal requirements, but that we're actually having a, a genuine collaborative positive relationship with our uh, tribal partners. So a couple things that have happened recently. Uh, Tina Brewer, who's our director of professional learning, she attended the Yakima Nation Education Collaborative uh, in December, so we were invited to be part of that. Uh, in February, uh, just last month, there was a Chinook Salmon Summit and there were four Yakima Nation presenters um, present there sharing history and culture with the students uh, connected to the, the Salmon Summit. So it was another great opportunity for collaboration there. What we haven't had in place is any sort of formal committee um, to help ensure that this collaboration is ongoing and, and really intentional. So that's what we're doing now is we're forming committees, uh, forming a district committee and then a Kamaikan High School like specific committee. Um, and these two committees will have overlap in their in their membership and, and the committee will include students and families and community members um, and staff members. And the goal, like I said, is to have that ongoing um, opportunity for relationship building, for shared understanding and learning, to help identify opportunities for uh, curricular connections and those kind of educational opportunities and celebratory opportunities for um, schools in the community. So when we look at um, the makeup of our student and staff population, we have 330 students in our school district who are um, um, American Indian or Alaska Native and 28 staff members. And so uh, what we have done is done some targeted invitation um, and then also provided the invitation to all to, to join into these efforts. So there's a, an invitation going out. Um, the first kind of district committee meeting is scheduled for March, March 16th. I believe that the invitation has been sent out. It went out late last week. Um, and so we're inviting people to be part of this group. Um, you can see the agenda there. The location is here. We are asking for RSVPs so we can plan accordingly. Uh, Mr. Washins will be at the meeting and I'm not sure who all else yet from the Yakima tribe, but um, like I said, we've also worked to identify families um, with tribal affiliation and students so they can be part of this effort as well. Um, again, I um, uh, regrets from Mr. Washins that he couldn't be here tonight. This was going to be my opportunity to introduce him and give him the opportunity to talk a little bit to the board, um, but we will have him come back at a future meeting. And that concludes my update. Do we have any questions? I, yeah, I just have two quick ones. Um, I can't remember. Uh, was this, is this state funded now since it was a state law or are we paying for the uh, the update to the gym floor and the turf yeah the state uh, is paying for all of that okay. so when the law was passed by the legislature with the mascots and logos and everything um, they provided some grant funding so basically we're just you know we, we get reimbursed for all the the changes that we're needing to make from the state including all the athletic gear that's been uh, repurchased and all correct. that stuff, right? All right. of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then with the with these two with the basketball floor and the turf floor, is that the last of it to kind of get us into compliance with all these changes? So moving forward we're we're in compliance. Mm -hmm. I'm looking over to my friends here and just kind of verifying I believe I believe so. Is that correct? I'm looking at you, Chris. But the two big projects, I mean, we've replaced those. signage and uniforms mm -hmm. and yeah, so it's been it's been a really, um, you know, 
educational and positive experience for us as a school district. And what we're really looking forward to is just continuing to strengthen that collaboration and and make sure we've got a real good positive relationship with our tribal partners. Sorry, I have one more. So what about the uh, other schools? So like the Southridge have anything up that has come like, like in the gym, like banners or logos or like, I know in some gyms they have like the team's name and maybe images are, are the other schools aware and have made those proper changes throughout like maybe yeah, the MCC so I think or something. Like if there's, you know, that's actually a really good, good question. Um, in terms of like banners that had something historical, like at the time that was the logo, right? Um, I don't know that we've we've <laughs> thought about going back to like all the different championship logos that are in gyms or banners that are hung to see if there's an old logo there. I just remember that would gyms need to they be have switched like, out like the yeah, like the school, mm -hmm. all the schools right. they play against and stuff. So I don't know if mm -hmm. we've looked at those mm -hmm. or if like Richland or Hanford have them or anybody like that. So anyways, yeah, yeah. Idea. And and I don't I don't I don't know. I, I need to just do some kind of double checking and looking into that if that's the intent of, you know, I mean, because like we can't go back and yeah. find every old yearbook, for example, right? And 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 change it out of what it was at the time. But I think it's what right. it is now, okay. and and moving forward. Yeah, Southridge has the logos of, of all the schools um, in mm -hmm. the gym. I know that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up is academic progress update. Ms. St. Hilaire will be presenting. All right, good evening. All right, we're going to take a few minutes to talk about just where we're at. Um, and our progress in our learning for our students. This is tied to one of our strategic plan goals that all of our students are making progress, both annual um, growth and meeting grade level standards. Um, tonight, we're gonna kind of review what some of our performance indicators are and then how we report them throughout the year. And it's gonna be pretty, pretty high up um, for all grade levels. Um, some of the performance indicators we look at, we have them for each grade level. We have to look at multiple measures and tonight I'm going to show you several different data points that we look at to see how our students are learning. Um, we also are looking, um, there's a list here of our key ones that we're looking at, reading, math, um, how our students are learning um, English, English language development, um, science, um, on track graduation, we've got some information about high school students and how they're passing classes or earning credits uh, towards graduation. Um, tonight, we'll focus mostly on growth. Um, so you've seen a document like this before. We've got um, growth and proficiency targets at each grade level that we're looking at in the areas of reading, math, language development. As the students get older, we've got some other ones as well that we listed on the previous slide. Um, so each grade level has goals that we're looking at. Um, in the past, we've done a lot of reporting in the fall and the spring. Um, a few years ago, we used to also do a mid-year one. For the last couple years, we haven't. And so we want to make sure we get that back in and that we're making adjustments and that we're keeping an eye on how our students are doing so we can continue to support them. And just real quick, I'm sorry, Alyssa. The reason we haven't right is because of COVID and yeah. we didn't have data. And so now we're back to getting our data regularly and can do a, a mid-year report that makes sense. So. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with our youngest learners that we have, which is our um, pre-K and uh, students. Um, when students come into kindergarten, they take an assessment called WAKIDS. WAKIDS actually stands for Washington Kindergarten Inventory of Developing Skills, WAKIDS. 
Um, and it's a kinder readiness assessment to see how are our kids coming into us. Along the bottom, you can kind of see the categories that are assessed in that assessment. So cognitive readiness, language readiness, literacy, math, physical readiness, social emotional readiness. And for our Kennewick kids this fall, you can see a percentage of how our students came in for being ready for school in Kennewick. The, this graph here kind of shows, um, for example, we had this many students who met criteria in all six of those categories. We had this many students who met three of those categories for kinder readiness. Those are all of our kindergartners. It's a requirement that we do this assessment. Um, and here's kind of a trend line of what that's looked like in our kinders that are coming into us. Um, this year, we have some new data to go with this um, set of uh, students for kindergarten. Um, uh, our, we have 155 students who were in our ECAP program, so that's a preschool program here in Kennewick. And we wanted to put scores next, so we knew how did our ECAP kids do going to preschool and how did that get them ready for kindergarten. Um, we also have another group of students, um, two classes of our TK or transitional kindergarten students. And we they all took the walk kids assessment this fall. And we just wanted to kind of put up to show what an impact ECAP has on our students and also transitional kindergarten to make sure they are ready for kindergarten. Let's see, moving up to a little bit bigger kids. Um, <laughs> Right. Yeah, so please. TK, is that transition. just transition? Okay, so okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So for um, elementary school, I'm going to show a little data on reading and also math. Um, for reading, our goals are around dibbles and how our students are progressing in in reading. So, long story short, we want less red and more green and blue. So these charts show the students at the beginning of the school year in kindergarten, first and second, when we're really focusing on that early literacy. And then we've all we've assessed all kinder first and second again this winter time to see how are they moving in the middle of the year. And we can see color wise um, the blue and green is growing in kindergarten and first grade. We need to look at second grade a little bit because our numbers aren't quite matching up. Um, it, it looks a little off there, um, but we definitely want to move from this intensive up to strategic and then to benchmark. The blue is doing great. So that's kind of how we're progressing in reading right now as, as um, measured with dibbles. Going up in grades for grades three, four, and five, we use the MAP assessment um, in both reading and in math. Um, and so these, the percentages we're seeing here are related to growth, not on gr not grade level. It's kids who are making the amount of growth they should be from fall to winter. Um, and I also want to point out, um, not all kids in third, fourth, and fifth take this in the winter time. They all take it in the springtime, but um, it's not a complete data source right now. The kids who took the test this winter, we're keeping an eye on. We're doing measures to see how they're doing and what we're doing is working. Um, so that's one reason these numbers are a lot lower and not the whole grade level. Yeah. Why is that? Um, we have other assessments that they're doing and it's a little bit longer test to do. So in our assessment plan, our third, fourth, and fifth graders all take it in the springtime every year, and we look at that growth through this measure. We have lots of other measures we use to see how they're doing. But those measures we don't see here, but correct. They just they exist, but we don't find out. Yeah, it could be grades, it could be star um, report uh, as well. And just to interject, so that is one of the things that we're looking at uh, in the in the past the target was fall to spring growth so all of the kids took it in the fall and then took it again in the spring uh, we switched to spring to spring growth because it's a better measure of of 
actual growth um, and and I can you know elaborate in you know maybe a follow up report or something about why that is. But since we changed the target from we've given buildings the ability to use some flexibility to use other assessments to gauge how kids are progressing. But every student's still going to take the map in the spring and we still look at did you grow from spring to spring? Did you make a year of growth? So how are they progressing in those other in so those, right those now, other ones? That we've uh, other, right. Yeah, so mm -hmm. right now 51% of our third graders have made their growth. Well, that's, an, that's of the that's students, of the took, of the students who took a map, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying yeah, I'm asking about so, the others. Yeah. So that's the thing that I was going to loop back to to say that we're, we're working on either. We what we need to do is ensure that if students if, if schools are not using map and they're using star or they're using the um, interim SBAs, which are also fine assessments to use. We don't have a good mechanism right now for collecting that data to be able to reported at mid year. So that's something that either we're going to need to move yeah. to everybody's going to need to do the map so we can have a complete data set or we're going to need to collect that data for star and and S and the SBA interim. So we just haven't standardized it. Yeah, Correct. because yeah, because and then when you don't have a standardized then it's really hard to compare one to another, right? It's yep. just like well, I don't know. And then and then now my my kind of thing is like what am I not seeing that might be falling through the cracks right and and I'm sure you guys are looking at it but yeah yep but we're not, right person. so right yeah. and the students that are here are students um, who have been below grade level our students who have been above grade level aren't required to take it in the winter time but I totally agree I, I understand what you're saying okay I'm going to take a minute to talk a little bit about dual language. We have goals for dual language that are slightly different because our outcomes are different. We want our kids to be fully bilingual, biliterate um, and multicultural when they leave our dual language program. So to measure biliteracy, we use the um, DRA and the EDLA DOS assessments um, and we give that. So we give that in English and in Spanish. Um, and we want students to fall into a zone. I'm going to show you what that is in just a minute. Um, this test um, helps assess students in reading level, performance level, oral reading fluency and comprehension. Once in Spanish, once in English, we look at the results bilingually. So what do I mean? Um, there's levels and for each grade level, there's a zone we want students to be in. So to be in the zone in first grade, you want to fall in these numbers for English and these numbers in Spanish. You'll notice it's not a direct number because these materials are translated, which means the Lexile go difficulty goes up significantly when it's a translation. But we want kids to fall here. A lot of times a kid in second grade might be here and here. That wouldn't be in the zone. Um, we want to make sure both English and Spanish are developing and it's, we call it a balanced bilingual. So how are we doing? Um, right now we've got data that shows all of our students who are in the English zone. Here they're in the Spanish zone and here are the percentages of students who are in both. It's a little different. Can I, yeah. Excuse me. Ask you a question. Yeah. Um, on your fourth and fifth graders, there. Um, yeah. Are those students that were not necessarily fully dual? No, all earlier? these students. They all have, were. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we have some students who might be new to Kennewick who start with us in third grade and they've come from another dual language program or they've come from another country, so they are definitely more proficient in Spanish right now, but we're going to get their English up and they would receive intervention in English. Thank you. Oh, Alyssa. Yeah, just on this chart right here, the the grade levels, that's current grade levels, right? So in, in theory, if we look at this data next year, yes, third grade group is going to be fourth grade. Yes. So we're able to look at this and, and say, OK, maybe that, that group of second graders might need some yeah. additional support yeah. or whatnot, right? Yeah, it's interesting here because um, 
third grades a lot higher than the other ones as far as being in the zone. It'll be nice to track them and have that data from year to year. Moving to middle school, we have more map data for both reading and math, and we, we do have the same problem here that we were talking about just a minute ago in grades three through five um, for where we're at in, in expected growth. It looks like the expected growth is higher in sixth grade, um, and then it does drop down a little bit in seventh and eighth grade for now. And then we're going to switch gears a little bit in high school and talk a little bit more about credits and passing classes because our goal is graduation uh, when we're getting to high school and our performance indicators for high school are are we on track to graduate so at the end of first semester for ninth grade that means i've got at least three credits we have some kids with four or five seven credits but we want at least three credits that means we've passed all our classes first semester and 81% of our students that did that this this first semester, 69% are on track in ninth in 10th grade, 64 in 11th, and 63 in 12th grade. And yes, yeah. so what interventions? I I know some of the interventions, but could you talk about all of the interventions for those students? Because obviously classes get harder, um, and the support that they get is different. Yeah, um, so it, it definitely varies. Um, one thing to think about with credit, we need credits in certain categories or certain buckets. Um, and sometimes when we go to interventions, that, that fills a certain bucket up as far as um, getting the academic support. Um, but we have tutoring, we have summer school for credit retrieval, we've got some APEX uh, retrieval options at, at each of our high schools as well. Um, so the students can try to get caught up. Can you speak to the success coordinators, how they participate in that? Yeah, and I actually would love to talk to that a little more about that with grades um, because they're checking in with students, regularly running lists of students and tracking them down, assigning them tutoring. It's an adult who knows, the kids know they're looking after how they're doing. And, and it's been very, very effective. So along those lines, our other performance indicator for high school level is passing all your classes. So that's everything but an F um, is passing. Um, so we had 74% of our ninth graders passing all of their classes. Ninth grade is really crucial too. It's such a change in classes and in credits. We really want our ninth graders to start out on track and stay on track. Um, and then you can see how many passed in 10th grade. 11th grade and then also in 12th grade. We want to try to get a couple more next semester. So at the end of the year I, in June, I can share how we're doing on that goal. So, it, yeah. That it seems like there's a miss uh, representation here in my, in my mind. If we go just look at 12th grade from this slide mm -hmm. above this slide, we're only at 63% of students meeting the goal. If you go to the slide um, before that. At 12th grade, about the, you know, the last year of high school, we're at 63%. But the very next slide showed 12th grade, 82% passing. What are, are they passing? Not enough. They're passing, but not enough for their classes to graduate. Yeah, they haven't. Yeah, they've got a little more to go before they've got all of them. So that seems like an opportunity for improvement. For sure. Okay. And I do, you know, now that you're you're raising that, Ron, I do want to just go back um, and we'll, we're going to just follow up mm -hmm. on the, the data on this slide okay. because I, I don't think it means that we have. It's like. Uh, What's 100 minus 63? <laughs> really 30, I just don't want to say, yeah, I don't think it means 37. Like for that percentage of kids who aren't going to graduate, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because our graduation rates are up in the, you know, almost like the high 80s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like there might, I don't, yeah, there's, there's things that happen on the transcript too. I mean, you do have to earn 24 credits. 
however there's the there's personal pathway um, there's there's all these rules and different things that I just wonder mm -hmm. if if we dig into the data it might show something a little different because it seems like a little bit of a yeah. too big of a gap what it's telling me is that 82 percent of our seniors are passing all their classes at as a senior mm -hmm. right it's so they're not earning the credit but yeah so but yeah so let, we're just yeah. going to follow up and dig into that a little bit more mm -hmm. and and yeah because i'm sure we're reporting i think that. that's i'm not proud no. to present that to the general public be honest with you if i was a parent a ninth grade student going to Kennewick schools i would be concerned about it that's 63, 60. And I know that you also have attendance data to go with that mm -hmm. and off the top of your head, because I know you always know everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. You know, the, the more our students are not with us, the less they have the opportunity to learn. And so um, lately, have we had any big measures to try to increase attendance. I, you know, a couple of years ago, we had the big attendance matters and all yeah. of that. I haven't seen a lot lately uh, in, in a big push. I know that's a push in every school. But. Yeah, I know ma there are some pushes. I can, can't can speak exactly to them. Yeah. Why don't we give you, uh, I can follow up on that too, um, okay. because we do have some attendance campaign um, work underway okay. um, start at the beginning of the year and then our, one of our goals this year is to have it continue right. um, all throughout the year uh, and there's also just been a, a push to help a better understanding of all the attendance um, rules and interventions around the uh, community they're not called community truancy board but it, mm -hmm. it's like okay. the community yeah. truancy board um, efforts and all those kind of things. So let let me get you a mid year update on that as well, just in a in a board report. That would be good. OK, nice. can, can I ask real quick too? So I'm, I'm a freshman. I walk right into school, zero credits. I fail one class my freshman year. Now I'm one class behind and there's no wiggle room to gain that credit back necessarily because I got to take six classes right. every year. Mm -hmm. So now I'm discouraged for whatever reason, um, have we, and so my understanding is um, PASCO uses a quarter credit system. Is it trimester? Or trimester, trimester. I'm sorry, yeah, trimester, yeah. Um, which allows for a little wiggle room. Have we ever, and, and maybe some on the board, you guys have talked about this at some point, but have we ever thought of that, utilizing that system to allow for some of that wiggle room? Legacy. So, if, yeah, so if Legacy is doing that, I mean, there's lots of reasons kids might fail a class, but if they fail it as a freshman, they might be discouraged enough to just not want to continue because they don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. So yeah, on the trimester, I don't I'm not aware of any. I, I don't know the history on that, so I can find out. I don't know if anybody was talking years ago when Matt know. was here. No, I just I just wanted to offer um, a couple of things on this slide and, and then we can talk. So, Remember that these are the credits like this is what we track in terms of students needing to be on on track for graduation. But we had kind of a big event happen over the last couple of years that has knocked that off a little bit. So we are seeing that less of our students are on track as seniors, but there are still these opportunities. So the GRU waiver is one opportunity where it helps students who maybe weren't able to attain credit during COVID. Um, and then the next slide that showed the grades I think Mr. Roberts, you're exactly right. It's students are passing. I mean, that's that's passing grades in all their classes, but they still may be deficient on the 21 credits. So they're 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 oh, passing right. their classes. So they're two kind of different data points in regards to that. So that's why that gap kind of exists. And then the third thing I would add is just you know we have had started having some discussions because when we started with the 24 credits. You know, we had a couple of years to go with that, and then we had COVID happen. And we have some concerns as we look at this data, and we may need to revisit that. Um, we've had some discussions in K-12 just around the trimester system and the ability that it provides students with more uh, credit earning opportunities. When we 
when the 24 credits first came on board, we had the discussion. Um, I recall um, that the board discussed that um, and it was and we decided to stay with the semesters and see if we could expand credit earning opportunities in middle school and those types of things. However, as we've gotten deeper into it, I think that that it is potentially something that we may want to discuss more um, as we move forward because it is certainly the, the tracking we're doing. We know we have some opportunities for students to to graduate with less than 24 credits um, that are afforded us, but those opportunities are going to be going away. So we right. definitely want to be paying attention to that. But that's a couple of contextual pieces I wanted to add. I have two questions. You might have the answer, but I want to pay the things first. No, I didn't. Yeah. So my two questions are again in re in regards to credits, and we just this isn't the main thing you're talking about, but it touches it. So like there's like sports, for example. Um, some of these kids are. are three sport athletes, you know, they're playing, you know, they're they're varsity lettermen for many years and and they're still required to take two PE two, two PE classes. I just kind of think that is there an opportunity there to to do something? I mean, it seems kind of crazy that if you're playing sports every single day for the school year that you have to also take PE and then when you can take something else. There seems like an opportunity or um, you know, there's a lot of church classes regardless of the religion that that can we can that we make that an, some, an elective somehow so now we now we give these opportunities that where some kids can and there might be other ones i'm just not thinking of but is there certainly so we, we do have currently a policy that part of our graduation policy 2410 i believe it is uh, that and it outlines the opportunities that students have to earn PE competency credit so they basically are excused from doing PE if they can demonstrate competency and for those students who participate in sports that is one way that they demonstrate competency. So if they're participating in sports, they are able to um, to uh, attain competency credit. And is it really that cut and dry? I mean, because I've heard it's a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. So like, well, there I is a, there is a there is a performance piece that you need to do. There is a, a testing portion, uh, there, but as far as the physical. Yeah. So there, there's two parts to PE. One is the knowledge portion of PE and one's the physical portion. So uh, what the law says is that students can ask to be excused from PE and if you're excused from PE, you still have to show competency in both the knowledge portion and the physical portion. If you participate in directed athletics, that can check the box for the directed for the physical portion because you're like physically doing something, something. Yeah. you still have to pass the knowledge portion i think our friend did <laughs> here is whispering in my ear that in her experience the knowledge portion of the pe assessment is challenging it's and so and <laughs> and and students have expressed that it's hard to know what materials to use to study for the test and that kind of thing so that's something that we're we're looking at um but that's how and, and then if you so if you pass the knowledge portion and you've participated in sports or directed athletics you can get pe credit through that venue and then and you, you don't have to be enrolled in a course you can take no no pe credits you still get that credit it's yeah retake. yeah it's it's an annual because you have to have one and a half pe credits mm -hmm. of the 24 and then a half a health credit so this doesn't have anything to do with the health credit but it does cover the one and a half pe credits but this is something that you do on an annual basis as a student so, so you, you earn a half a credit, you know, a, have a credit, half a credit, have a credit a semester. A or, okay, and then yeah. and then Thank and again and then the the church type things, you know, and there's there's religious things that people kids take. Is there any way to yeah. to make that an elective? Right now, there's not currently any avenue under the state. Is it a board state law? Mm -hmm. It's all state board driven. All of our graduation requirements are to 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 make that um, credit bearing. Um, to my knowledge, I, I mean, we can certainly can double check on that, that yeah. and dig into that. What I will say is there is, um, and we just are waiting for the OSPI rules around it, um, going to be opportunity for students to be able to earn credit through work, elective credit idea. through yeah. work. Mm -hmm. That's so um, I think statewide, there is some effort to look at what are opportunities for students to, to earn you know, what are other avenues for students to earn credit? I'm just not aware of one. That was my third thing right that, there is, yeah, something the like that. Courses, yeah, can we just can dive into that and look yeah. and find yeah. all those there different ways? There are two other ones yeah. as well that we have. We have world language competency credits. So students who speak another language other than test English out of it. can test for, and get up to four credits. Um, and we test, like, I want to say over 30 students uh, a month mm. with that one. 
There's also a computer competency assessment to get that graduation requirement. OK, I just would encourage our to push it to our counselors and because I just when I hear from kids that they're not this isn't really happening. They're stressing about these credits and there's all these opportunities. You know, there's not a lot, but there's a few opportunities and maybe there's more. We look into it. Maybe our, maybe it's like communicate this to our counselors to help, help, help them be creative and, and offer these. And, and, and you know, we want to make sure families and students are aware too, right? So it's yeah, of all, all of the opportunities. So we agree. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was going to talk a little bit about MTSS, but we I mean we can do just a little bit or we can move on. OK, so it's just an opportunity to talk a little bit about MTSS. If you've heard that, it stands for multi tiered systems of support. Um, there's some great visual aids that talk about this. Um, we really want 80 at least 80 percent of our students in tier one that means 80 percent of our students are having success in core content passing classes learning making their growth they're on grade level um, we've got some students who need just a little bit more maybe a little more time maybe redo something um, hear it another way have it retaught to them um, that we don't want to have a huge number in there, but we do have those kids who just need a little bit more. And we would say that's kind of tier two. This can be for behavior. It can be for academics, attendance, social, emotional. Dyslexia. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, and then for our more intensive students, we ha we um, have them at the top of the pyramid. We want that to be small. We don't want schools to be an inverted triangle. OK, we've got a very targeted intervention for a smaller number of students, maybe getting specially designed instruction, um, getting really targeted interventions and really keeping a close eye on it to make sure kids are growing. And if they're not, we're making adjustments. Um, so all of our schools are working on this and we at the district are also working on creating um, multi tiered systems of support. And I'll just add on to say, I mean, you've seen this visual before. Um, if if less than 80% of our students are experiencing success, then we need to continue to take a hard look at mm -hmm. what is tier one. What is the universal instruction that every student is getting? And is there something we need to be doing more different there to meet the needs of more kids? When it comes to um, like tier two graduation success coordinators, um, there's people, there's programs, you know, partnerships. There's those things that we do in our schools, the tutoring, all of those kind of things that would fit into that tier two. And then if those things aren't working, then it's that then it's tier, tier three. three. So we just like to th this the the this whole um, MTSS system is is a, an approach, right? To how do we make sure that the needs of all students are being met? Nobody's falling through the cracks, mm -hmm. and um, it pertains to like Alyssa said, it's a, based on behavior you know, behavior and academic and so, oh, social emotional needs because they're all tied together. Mm -hmm. So they might need intervention on attendance, mm -hmm. right? So th this is what we're just continuing to try to help all, you know, system wide kind of understanding mm -hmm. of um, as we look at our data and our programs. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. two questions really quick. One, uh, ECAP, uh, we had 11% of our students um, in 21, 22, do that program we had two percent do transitional kindergarten do we have the ability to have more than that or is that kind of maxed out based on our ability and, and how do people are you talking about transitional kindergarten, transitional kindergarten actually yeah. in the legislative update I, I know it's i know <laughs> it's in there i'm just no, yeah. but it's a great. I mean, um, I can for, actually yeah, do that yeah. In yeah, we update. have 248 slots, I think, in ECAP right now. Some aren't going to kindergarten. They'll be in ECAP for two years, right. um, and we get that funding from DCYF. It's not through OSPI and K-12. So they apply for slots when they're available, um, and if we can take more, we will. Right now, right now we have all of them filled that we have. Awesome. OK, awesome. And then just the, the last question is probably more of a data request. Do we have just the specific percentage of kids who are in third grade passing math, third grade passing writing? Is that the OSPI scorecard or do we? Because yeah. this so, showed a lot of 
like maybe the kids that weren't passing or that were above grade level, but I'm interested in just seeing where we are in the core mm -hmm. subjects with kids on grade level. Yeah. So I just want to um, remind the board, this is something that we um, update and present in the fall of every year, and it's on our district website. So, okay. And so I just want to show you where it is. Perfect. Um, and anybody else who's watching here, what this is doing. <laughs> I know, why is it doing that? Okay. Might be an easier way to get to it, but if you just put in strategic plan, it takes you to the page um, where our plan and our goals are. And on that page is our district performance indicators and targets. And that's, there was one snapshot of it in, in Alyssa's presentation, but this um, is where we have all of the data that you're um, looking at. So for example, if you wanna know, oh, this is one way to look at it, and I'll show you another way too. But like if you want to know um, how many of our students are meeting standard in math for um, grade five, here's our current data. I think it does for like how many are passing. Yep, yeah, that's, that's this. Yeah. That's this data. Yeah, yeah. Passing data passing. Passing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's right here. Um, another way that we can we can send you this, but you can go to the OSPI. Anybody can go to the OSPI report card yeah. and, and get the data there too. But we track it as part of our um, performance indicators. Um, the, what you can do easily on the OSPI website is look by school. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? All right, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Melissa. Mm -hmm. Okay, next item is the 23-24 preliminary budget. Mr. Roberts will be presenting. All right, we're just going to touch on a couple funds here. Uh, transportation we're going to look at and the debt service fund. Some of these other funds we'll, we'll catch later in the next uh, two or three months. And the transportation vehicle fund. So that's where the, the state, uh, you know, gives us money based on the number of buses we have and depreciation, and that's how how we fund replacing our buses. <clears throat> buses are depreciated over 13 years, and um, you know, based on their formula and that depreciation, uh, we're going to get about 1.2 or 3 million dollars this this year. The state did increase the the uh, replacement cost they were using for the depreciation. Um, used to be about 120,000, I think it's up to around 148,000. Still quite a bit uh, less than what it cost to buy a bus, but resulted in uh, a little more money for us. The fleet is 139 uh, buses at August 31st uh, last year. And uh, April will be presenting later in the month, the next board meeting, but uh, she'll be looking at eight buses uh, for delivery summer 2024. But she'll have a presentation on bus operations next board meeting. So the transportation vehicle fund, you can see the adopted budget over here and then the projected. So uh, quite an increase in the depreciation amount, 1.3 million. And then the buses uh, coming this summer, we ordered those last year. That's about $1 million there. So we will have a little bit extra here in the ending fund balance and that that money will be used to buy uh, hopefully eight buses for delivery summer 2024. And. Um, and then we just have placeholders here. The state requires us to do a four year projection and just a placeholder here on the depreciation uh, reimbursement and um, a placeholder for bus purchases. So hopefully the, the depreciation will be an uh, increase uh, from these projections and we'll be able to buy uh, more buses. And April will touch on, you know, electric vehicles and some things like that uh, next part. And then a debt service fund. <clears throat> so we have a debt service fund. That's where we uh, collect the, the taxes to pay off our debt. 
the public, they, they approve the bonds. You know, they Vic, approve. I'm yes. sorry, I'm sorry. I'm always a heartbeat late. Transportation, when we have those buses coming in, mm -hmm. what become of the old buses? They surplus them and uh, April normally would would say on uh, her presentation how many they're going to surplus. Uh, there are buses that are, you know, they require uh, a lot of work to put back in play. They're not getting any more depreciation on them. Uh, generally, they're usually just not used a lot anymore. But, but so when they're surplus, are they sold? Or is, is that revenue mm -hmm. that's generated by the sale of the old buses? So we have to surplus them by state law, and sometimes uh, we will sell them. People will bid on them. Uh, we don't make a lot of money on them when we do surplus a sale in the summer. Uh, there's all sorts of furniture and different things. Okay. Thank you. So back to the debt service fund. So uh, when, when a bonds pass, say it's 100 million or, or whatever that is, uh, the um, the debt service is projected, and we provide you know uh, levy rate kind of our amounts to, to the public based on what that will cost them. And then here in 22, 23. Uh, pretty close to budget, uh, the local taxes collected to you know pay off that debt. Uh, 17.25 million is what we expect to get. That converts to about a dollar 38 uh, per thousand, and um, that goes to pay the the bonds uh, principal and interest coming due. So this year that's 16.3 million, and then uh, it looks like down here oh that's quite a bit of money. But this is as of August 31st these numbers, and we have to make a debt payment every December. So in about December 31st, this, this number is about one to two million dollars. And, and based on rule of thumb, that's what we're supposed to have there. And then we make another debt payment in June. Uh, so you can see the projections out here and some of the debt. Down here, it drops off a little bit. Our debt decreases. And uh, that's why you see this, this reduction here. Uh, if another bond is ran, this would uh, change. So here's a, this is the debt outstanding up here. Uh, total principal outstanding, 184 million. And you can see the, the total debt service. And then debt capacity, school districts by law can only uh, you know, issue so many so much debt based on the law. 5% of assess, assessed value is the limit, less whatever principal's out there. So we're well below uh, the debt limit. We have uh, $446 million that you could go out and try to do a bond. And then the, here you see the levy, the history of the, the levy rate to uh, fund the debt, at about $1.38 here, 2023. Uh, it should be pretty level here. And then down here it drops off. And, and this is where we discussed, you know, do we do we run another bond, uh, take advantage of that? And uh, that's what we'll be working on projecting those costs, you know, for those projects over the next year, involving facility committee, uh, probably even the bond and levy committee, is there a big part of it, school board? So. Uh, and that'll be done here the next uh, 12 months to try to figure some of that stuff out and bring it back to folks. So any questions on the debt uh, service or transportation funds? That's really about, about all I had. Any questions? And these numbers, you know, you'll see them again in June when we do the budget. They really shouldn't change much. Uh, if anything significant, I would point that out. Have some more meetings as we go through some of the other funds. All right, thanks. Thanks, Vic. Yep, sir. OK, next up is a legislative update. Dr. Pierce. OK, well, this is a time of year where uh, we're about halfway through the session. And it's a good time to provide an update and I've got some information. I'm sure board members um, have information potentially from the, uh, <laughs> the 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 recent conference, but at this time of year, you know things change so quickly. I completely overhauled the presentation <laughs> from uh, what you were sent on Friday, but we are at the halfway point um, of the 105 day session. Uh, Synodia, I always have to think about how to say that, uh, or final adjournment scheduled for April 23rd. Uh, just as a reminder, the board uh, has an annual process for setting legislative priorities, and these are the priorities that we really stick to and speak to 
um, as we're working with uh, legislators during the session. Some of the key issues uh, this time around focus on special education funding, transportation funding, and on transitional kindergarten, which we saw a little data from tonight. So that's the focus of, of my report, and then board members might have other things to share related to other bills. But just starting with education uh, funding, special education funding, the, the problem uh, is that currently the statewide gap between what school districts spend and what the state provides statewide is it's $800 million gap. And in our districts, it's about a $2 million gap. And I think that's still about what it is. Uh, uh, yeah, we have a pretty good enrollment increase this year. About a $2 million gap. So there are two bills, a Senate bill and a House bill on the table to try to address special education funding. Um, you know, it's always good to try to make inroads. Neither of these bills come close to closing the gap, but would provide some additional funding. So uh, one of the bills is um, the Senate bill. The second substitute version of 5311 passed the Senate on March 3rd. It's now in the House and it's been referred to the Education Committee. This bill uh, increases the cap that's currently in place from 13 and a half to 15%. Um, it does provide some multiplier increases at 1.12 for the students who are in the gen ed setting for 80% or more of the school day and at 1.06 for students who are in the gen ed setting for less than 80% of the school day. Um, for safety net, the high need safety net staffing that we can apply for um, beginning in 23-24, um, this says that uh, that eligibility is if the cost for providing the individual education for the student is two times the average per pupil expenditure if the district's less than a thousand in size, so that's not us, um, but it'd be 2.2 uh, times the average pupil per pupil expenditure for districts like ours with more than a thousand students. A couple other parts to this bill is that it says that OSPI will develop an allocation and cost accounting methodology to ensure that the funding is essentially used as it should. Apparently there's some discussion at the legislature or feeling that from some legislators that districts aren't necessarily appropriately using their special education funding, which is certainly not the case um, in any district I know and certainly not the case in our district. Um, but uh, th that's been some of the discussion. And um, the other part of this uh, bill says that there'd be an education ombuds assigned to each ESD region and that uh, the role of that person, you know, they don't work for the district or anything. They um, serve as an advocate and a resource for parents and families. They could attend IEP meetings and things like that. So those are sort of the key parts of, of this bill and where it stands today. Um, the House bill, the first substitute version of 1436, passed the House on March 2nd. It's now in the Senate and it's been referred to the Early Learning and K-12 Education Committee. This bill eliminates that funding cap um, and it does it in a, in a phased approach. So for 23-24, it would be at 14%. It would then uh, increase to 14.5, then to 15% in 25-26 and 26, 27, and then effective 27, 28, that cap would be eliminated. And uh, it, you know, essentially any student who qualifies for special education would be funded. The district wouldn't be capped at the current 13 and a half percent. It also has a multiplier. It's a four year phase in. Um, I won't read you all the numbers, but you can see that for students who are um, receiving special education, um, and in the gen ed setting for 80% or more of the school day, you can see what those multipliers are for the next four years. And then what the multipliers are for the students who are in the gen ed setting for less than 80% of the school day. Um, this bill also includes some language about OSPI reviewing disproportionality and assisting with inclusionary practices, professional development for school districts. So we've been working to, you know, um, increase inclusionary practices and ensure that our students who need to be in the gen ed setting 
um, is, is, you know, they can be appropriately as much as possible. And then this one also, again, it's that kind of accountability question that's coming up in the legislature about use of funding. This one has JLARC conducting a performance audit of the state's special education system. So there's some accountability measures there. So that's where the two special education funding bills are. I also included some information provided to us from Dan Steele um, from WASA that shows um, again what those what the current multipliers are and what OSPI is requested and then what um, what the kind of original bill had and then what the current version of the bill has. So you can see that um, you know the the multipliers requested by OSPI given the funding gap were quite a bit higher and the original bill they were higher and now they're coming down to be lower. <laughs> so I mean it, it's it's all about money <laughs> and uh, the legislature's got to figure out you know how much money can go toward helping address this issue that's a real issue that districts are are facing. Um, the next slide shows the house version um, of the bill and that same kind of multipliers what the OSPI request was, what the current multipliers are, what the state request was and then how that um, has kind of changed with the different versions of the House bill. Um, and then of the two current bills as they stand currently, um, just looking ahead to fiscal year 24-25, which was it would be our school year 23 to 25 budget, it shows what those multipliers are in kind of comparing those two bills. Um, I'll just keep going, but you pause at any time if you want to interject any information about any of the <laughs> of the bills or any other information on special education. Do you want to pause there? I just a comment from last Thursday. So tomorrow we will hear some more since the cutoff was at five today. So <clears throat> there could be some differences like now. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that we were told um, last Thursday was that um, you know when things come to the floor then amendments are can be made and they'll massage it around some more and uh drew stokesbury um is going to bring up an amendment um to the senate bill which keeps the cap at 15 but does not phase out um those things and also matches the senate bill um for the pre-k money okay. so there's I, they're still trying to there, there are people still trying to get money in where money was not in before and then the other um thing was the esd advocates there's some legal issues about that because they are esd employees but they would be working with families and it could be going against esd policies mm -hmm. and so um braun has an addition which would um, move that to the office of education on both taking that out of okay. Yeah, and that that's what I read this afternoon in preparing for this. It was that same thing that it would be um, through the office of the ombuds, but they'd be assigned to an ESD region, okay. but not through the ESD. Not Good. an ESD Because that's employee. originally where it was, okay. and that was yeah. like a legal issue. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. On the transportation side, um, the problem is really similar to special education and that there's a big gap between what most districts pay to transport students and what the current funding model provides from the state. And that gap for us, you know, historically has been about, I think it's about 1.7, I rounded up to two, about $2 million a year. Okay, thank you, Vic. Um, so there's a couple of transportation bills and I'll just give the status of where we are with those. Um, the second substitute version of 5174 passed the Senate on March 3rd. It's now in the House. It's been referred to appropriations. Um, what this bill says is that um, OSPI must provide transportation safety net awards. So kind of similar to the special education high needs safety net awards that districts apply for. Um, that that would um, be a requirement of OSPI and the wording in the bill says to districts with a convincingly demonstrated need 
for additional funding for special passengers and special passengers are designed are defined as um, you know, students receiving special education services, um, students requiring um, transportation under McKinney Vento, so homeless students, um, students in foster care, etc. So it would be a process of applying for additional funding. Um, the bill also says by June 1st, 2026, OSPI must provide an analysis of district transportation costs and allocations. Um, following the 24-25 school year. So they would look at things like mileage ridership costs and then make recommendations for a new transportation funding model. So it's nothing immediate in terms of what I could tell <laughs> um, from this bill except for the, the high needs um, transportation funding. And then on the house side, 1248 is in the house. Still, it was referred to rules to review on February 16th. This one also has that safety net award language in it. And um, this one also doesn't apply to us because we don't contract out for transportation services, but it, it has a, a big section about districts providing SEB benefits for transportation contractors. And I know there's a lot of discussion about that across the state. So that's what I know about transportation as of today. The one thing about that, that that's an issue like Seattle and Tacoma Public Schools mm -hmm. um, is that it's an unfunded mandate. There's no money to pay those people. Right. So that's big money. Yeah. Yeah. OK, anybody have anything they want to add about transportation? <laughs> anything you know that I don't know? <laughs> I mean, everything's still a work in progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, nothing, nothing's through. down there. They're, halfway done so let's this will change a bunch by the time we review this again in a couple of weeks for sure and each time there seems to be a watering down mm -hmm. effect yeah. so, you know just because it passed we shouldn't get super happy because it may not look like what it did uh, it's definitely not going to look like what it did originally we're still <clears> discussing <throat> on the floors and or still, will be yeah. well the discussions are bargaining and they add, take away. Anyway, it's an interesting process. Sure. OK, kind of the, the last um, big area I just wanted to touch on was transitional kindergarten, and that you know came up tonight as part of the presentation on our academic um, progress. You know, from our perspective, um, I'll get to the problem at the, at the end <laughs> of this, but so the situation is that many districts, including our districts, um, had started transitional kindergarten programs and we've seen really good success in those programs. Um, and an analysis of the statewide data from fall of 2022, OSP, OSPI found that students who participated in transitional kindergarten outperformed their peers in all six domains. And we showed you data tonight from our students that shows that that same, that same um, trend, right? So um, how transitional Kindergarten is currently funded is through basic education and the bill um, about this change proposes that transitional kindergarten would be changed to transition to kindergarten. Um, it changes the funding model, so it takes it out of basic ed funding. Um, it changes the teacher certification requirements. It makes the teacher have to have an early ed or a special education endorsement and it adds a, a lot of other requirements around screening and eligibility and reporting and so forth. And so from our perspective and many districts perspective, kind of the problem is, is the current model is working <laughs> and we don't see a reason for it to be changed. But the reality is that I think that there's some kind of territory disputes between early learning and K-12 and, you know, who should have sort of ownership and control. And, you know, if you're not quite in kindergarten yet, do you, are you part of early learning or are you part of the K-12 system? So we're, we're kind of caught in the middle of this, I think, larger statewide issue. But from our perspective in many districts, it's it's like we're, we're seeing good progress with what we're doing. We'd like to be able to continue it, but it doesn't look like that's going to be able to happen. Um, the transitional kindergarten uh, substitute, it's, in, it's the second substitute bill passed the House on March 6th. It's now in the Senate and it's been referred to early learning in K-12 ed. Um, like I said, it eliminates transitional kindergarten, replaces it with transition to kindergarten. 
Um, it separates the funding from the current basic ed funding model. It freezes the number of programs that could be started, so we couldn't add, um, expand our current. We have two classrooms right now of transitional kindergarten. Um, we couldn't expand them, and then by um, 2024, we'd need to convert those to transition to kindergarten. Now, in, in talking with a couple of our legislators, it sounds like they one of our concerns was, you know, one of the benefits of having them in our elementary schools is students are seeing they're part of the elementary school. They're getting that jump start. They're seeing what it's like to be part of an elementary school and experiencing many of the same things. And so if they if they're in an early learning center, you know, they don't quite have that benefit, but it sounded like you could still house the program potentially in in the elementary schools. Again, it does change the um, the certification requirements and things like that. So again, it's all still in progress. We're still trying to kind of figure it all out and see what the impacts would be. But this is one of those things that I think came about as a larger statewide issue and unfortunately kind of catches school districts in the middle who started down a road and are seeing some success and now we're going to have to potentially change everything. So any other <laughs> comments on transitional kindergarten? Question, what, what is our cost for transitional kindergarten here right now? Just ball, ballpark. Well, we have two two teachers, two classrooms. Um, yeah, and, and two pairs, I think, as well. Yeah, so and that's the thing. It's been kind of a break even, you know, just like um, just like every other grade level, right? Yeah. Yeah, we oh, did right start. Too, thank you, Vic, for reminding me of that. Like we started because it's kind of a jump start to kindergarten program. So the students started in mm, December, January, mm -hmm. and then they get their like kind of. They get a, a few months of kindergarten right before kindergarten actually starts. So one of the things on um, on the second that they said was that OSPI thinks and so I, that makes me nervous, but OSPA thinks that most districts would who are already you know having those programs would gain funding, but there was no specification as to how that's going to happen. It was just OSPI says. So I don't know if you've heard any, if, Vic, if you've heard any information about that. Maybe we'll hear tomorrow more about it. Yeah, and I can try to follow up from with Dan Steele too, yeah. or some people and just see if there's anything else I can find out. I mean, you know, whatever they decide, we'll try to what we want to do is we've seen a benefit. Kids benefit. Um, we want to make sure that all kids are in some kind of early learning program because it helps them get ready for kindergarten. And so if we can't do it the way we've been doing it, we're going to try to figure out how do we do it in a different way so we can continue to serve kids who need program. So we're, we're seeing results with trans transitional kindergarten and now we're we have to stop while the legislators determine I mean we can't expand it while the legislators determine how they want us to run it if if this bill passes um, and the governor signs it then it would freeze it would freeze the number of programs through the current biennium so and then we would have a year that's how I'm understanding it to transition from what we do currently to the new transition to kindergarten. That's correct. Which may not be tremendously different. I mean, it'll we'll see because they're still talking about who, what age kids and who and it's a little confusing. I think there's yeah, some confusion. It, there. I'm okay. confused. I'll tell you right now. It doesn't make sense. but. Yeah, and, no. and this is split amongst the legislator too. I think there was 40 no's on this bill and 55 or 57 yeses. So, you know, there's been a lot of energy from districts and it, who've had their programs even longer than we've had ours, you know, and really don't want to have to change because they're seeing it's working. It's kind of that local versus state. And I think there was stuff. theoretically, and I use that word carefully, but there were there are places that are not doing anything and this was a way to make it happen perhaps. And so, like you said, those who are already doing it and they're having great um, experiences and, and great 
uh, turnout from the students are caught in the middle when everybody else will be doing that. So, you know, things change, right? Every every year. So it could change next year if they do something this year. OK, and then just finally, just a couple other, you know, um, bills of interest that we've kind of keep, been keeping an eye on um, the isolation restraint that pertains to special education students that passed the house on March 7th. Um, the universal meals <coughs> passed the house on March 2nd and the prejudgment interest died in committee, which is a very good thing. <laughs> Although, as they say, it will be back next mm -hmm. year, just like it did yeah. this year. Yeah. And, and so that's all I have, but um, the board might have other information or observations the, or the not. Universal Meals is only K-5. K-5. Uh, sadly, mm -hmm. for this year. So the, the event that, that everyone went to, the three of you guys went to, and talking to our representatives, and so then how is that, how is that working? Are they they're speaking to all their potential school districts within their purview? and? gathering feedback to make their vote or whichever, right? So yeah. when we met, it wasn't just the three of us. It was um, all of the ACO, well, not all of, but it was many of the ACLD yeah. districts. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, just like the, the 1479, the, the restraints, the isolation restraints, Skylar Rood worked really, really hard, just amended the Jesus out of it yeah. trying to make it more palatable because again they were trying to, to take away that that tool yeah and I don't I, I and again that passed last night at like midnight <laughs> so I had no idea what it says but I, I know that he worked very very hard to get that to be something that we could live with right and I think that's the big thing is that a lot of the stuff ultimately with the makeup of the legislator all we can hope for is to make some of these luck these these bills less bad right and, that, and that's and that's the most we can hope for so. yeah yeah and, and i do want to say you know our legislators have been extremely receptive um wanting information reaching out for information um and opinion on things that's super appreciated and i know that they've been working really hard um you mentioned till midnight people been yeah I, I think maybe dan Steele earlier this week in one of our meetings mentioned or one is one of the people on the zoom that they they're they've been like up all night yeah, they've been up for uh, um, days so yeah two in the morning for like mm -hmm. five so days. we really do appreciate yeah. our our legislators advocating for us and, and accessibility Every one of them that I talk to, they're accessible. You know, they're, it's not like don't talk to me, talk to my aide. You will get some of that if they're on the floor or something. Right. But, uh, yeah, they are pretty accessible, accessible, and they. I'm impressed because they're usually taking notes also as you're talking to them. It's just not a I'm listening to you now. You leave. <laughs> I, I'm impressed. I don't know if they have me fooled or what. It, it went well. Well, it's one of the one of the things that representative connors said and uh, representative barnard the same um, is that one of the things that they would like to do after session and and our legislators have done this in the past um is there's a thing called legislators in the classroom and they come in and they do you know a classroom or two but they would really like to come in and spend uh, um not not just a you know drop in drive by kind of thing but actually come in and spend real time in a classroom more than for 30 minutes one time and so they'd like to really see things especially things talk like the restraint or the meals or the specific transportation those kinds of things they really want to see because next year then they can find tune those things mm -hmm. so i was very um thankful and um made me feel good about that they're really you know they're they're new and they're really grabbing onto these things and they're really working with us and and thinking ahead and so that was very helpful and i will say one thing um i was involved very early on that senate bill 5059 you don't wait for that meeting that we went to you get involved super early when you first hear about these things and let people know that hey, that's not in the best interest of the schools and then they hear it over and over again and you know that's how you get yeah. you persuade yeah. you get the message over mm -hmm. if you wait to just last week that might not be enough time to do 
posted something about right. it. So yeah. They can share it. And that's one of the things they talked about at that meeting, too, was every region has different needs, right? And it's if, if you don't hear, if they don't hear from their region, so they can't share it, then nothing happens. And they really do want to do that. Yeah. Perfect. Any other questions or comments? Not about not about this. I do have a question about something else. Something else. All right. Well, we're we're moving along here. We got no no unfinished business, no new business. What would you like, sir? Uh, I, I'm I'm concerned with something one of the speakers said because of my ignorance. I didn't quite understand uh, the speaker that was saying that said each one of our names, including Patty. <laughs> Good, Patty. I don't know what was the. Do ever anybody know what the ask was? I, I I think it would be best for me to do a follow up. Okay. okay. With the board and, and provide you with some information. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so next, our next meeting agenda. So we've got the 23-24 preliminary budget. We have asset preservation and a couple of things that we'd like to add here. Um, we've had a request here to talk about uh, Southridge High School facility naming the gym. And we'd also want to talk about policy 5252 uh, staff participation in political activities. So those will both be on our agenda for the next meeting. Uh, anything else you guys would like to add, talk about? London, want to put anything on the agenda? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> yes, sir. I see some of the staff walking around with KSD t-shirts. So. Can, can the board in a show of unity also have uh, t-shirts? <laughs> I don't think that needs to be an agenda. I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> I will yeah, say I that the that. Richland board members have very nice jackets with their names on them. <laughs> they also have, they have they also have polo shirts. Yes, they do. Yes. Just to let you know that. Yeah. Okay, so <sighs> sweetens the pot just a bit. Chris. Unity. We want to show. <laughs> We got your name tag. Yeah, 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 I was excited about that. I want to dress. Yeah, I want to dress like Valentine. There you go. All right. If nothing else, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.